The Seamus Ennis Arts Centre first opened its doors in 2001. In memory of the great piper Seamus Ennis, the centre aims to commemorate his work in the performance, archiving and promotion of Irish music. Through concerts, workshops, education, festivals, media and other events, the centre provides a platform where works by those whose mastery and love of Irish arts can be explored and their contribution to their art forms safeguarded and made accessible to future generations. On a cold and dark February evening in 2019, we innocently brought together five of the piping elders to celebrate the 100th birthday of the late Seamus Ennis and to each play his famous 1840s coin pipes. Dr. Porig Makmahuna played whistle and flute as a child, moving on to the pipes at 17. A skillful balance of his medical and musical commitments has been the hallmark of a life dedicated to culture and care. Waterford piper Dr. Jimmy O'Brien Moran fell in love with the pipes in the early 1970s. His great influences were Willie Clancy and Seamus Ennis, whose recordings he hungrily consumed. Naley Mulligan was introduced to Irish music as a child by his father Tom, a Leitrim fiddler and piper. Naley has been at the very centre of Irish piping ever since. Peter Brown began playing Irish music at the age of six under the watchful eyes of Leo Rosen, Willie Clancy and Seamus Ennis. Peter joined RTE Radio in the 1970s and remained there for over 40 years, becoming a dedicated caretaker of Irish music culture. My name is Ronan Brown and I began worrying the Irish pipes when I was seven. Upon meeting Seamus Ennis in the mid-1970s, I was immediately taken under his musical wing and I eagerly sought him out on every occasion possible. It was often said that it takes 21 years to make a piper, seven years listening, seven years practicing and seven more playing. All the pipers featured here tonight have more than doubled those 21 years. But experienced as we all are, strapping on Seamus Ennis's coin pipes and setting about playing them would always be a formidable task. Doing this without any prior rehearsal, and as we are soon to find out one particular yet obscure peculiarity of this instrument, makes the task even more challenging. Will we crash and burn, or will we emerge with our dignity intact? Let you decide as we watch Seamus Ennis's Pipes versus Five of Ireland's Best. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the atrium here in Fingal County Hall. I'm delighted to see such a large crowd here to celebrate the launch of Seamus 100, a year of celebrations to commemorate the centenary of the birth of Seamus Ennis. The team at the Seamus Ennis Arts Centre is delighted to honour and celebrate Seamus Ennis, this remarkable man whose legacy inspired the establishment of an art centre in Knoll in his memory. He's a performer who has captivated and influenced so many musicians across the decades. A world-class musician, singer, raconteur, linguist, folklore collector and broadcaster. We look forward to entertaining you with great music, songs and stories throughout this year's centenary of Seamus's birth. So with that in mind, I'll stop talking and I'll hand you over to Ronan Brown, Gurmila Mahagov, Agus Buintanavas and Leru. I think for all of us, it's, it's sort of bittersweet to have this happening. We'd love, we'd love Seamus to still be around very, very much. All of us here have spent great times with Seamus. Always a little bit nervous in his company and he, he called the shots. But we, we all learned so much. We were all the young ones. 
Ivor, my father, was the one who was of roughly the same age. Ivor is going to be celebrating his 90th birthday now in a couple of weeks' time. We all carry Seamus and his music in our hearts and in our minds and in our fingers. We, I think most of us, if not all of us, played Seamus's pipes as, as children. And uh, most often we would find it very difficult. None of us, apart from Porig, who now has the pipes, they were, they were bequeathed to Porig by Liam O'Flynn. Seamus gave them to Liam before he passed away. And uh, none of us have really played them since we were children. So it could be very interesting to see <laughs> how we get on. When Seamus played them, if you listen, we, we, our memories is one thing, but if you listen back to the, the, the recordings, you hear the pipes in various states. Sometimes they were perfect, beautifully in tune, wonderfully aggressive in his hands. And then other times they were completely out of tune and hardly working at all. So, you know, expect the latter from most of us tonight. Except Porrick. Except Porrick, who's used to them. <laughs> <laughs> That's like it, no you know. So what I might do is just pass you on now to Peter Brown to say a few words about Seamus. Well, I'll come up here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, it, it is a great pleasure to be here to welcome the mayor to everyone else. Um, somewhere in the display there you'll see the front cover in, of an LP where he's leaning up against a tree. And before we actually met him, we, we, the family, we knew him, my parents knew him through Ivor, I think. But myself and my brother Oliver didn't know him, but we learned every tune on the record. I remember the first time we did actually see him was at a flat hole somewhere in the country, and myself and my brother recognised him from the picture and rushed forward. And one of the many things about Seamus was he was exceedingly good with children. Maybe in some way he, he was, aspects of him may never have fully grown up, is one way to put it. He had, he had a, sort of a child's mind in some way. And from that, there was a sort of an, an acquaintance that, that grew up over time. He frequently visited our house, and then I knew him through broadcasting. I've often wondered where his genius actually came from, because he was that. First of all, he was a superb piper. Today's pipers will probably say to you that they still listen to him to see what it was he was doing. I, I've, you, you always have to be careful with Piper saying that he was the best, but you can get away with it by saying that there was none better than him. And certainly, he, when I hear his playing, I still marvel at it, and that's quite something. Some of the recordings done back as early as 1940, when he was only 21. But then he was a superb singer as well, which he may have learned through his acquaintance with Colin O'Loughlin, who was a, owned this place called the Three Candles Press, and was a very good family friend, and had a, a sort of a choir called Unclashkadal. If he wasn't known as a piper, I believe that his singing in Irish and English was just, just exquisite. He wasn't a native speaker, obviously, because of where he came from, but, but it was like as if he was. And he was able to speak the Irish of all the different Gaeltachs that there are. And there's a sort of a proof of this, because in the Radio Air and Archive, there's a series called Seamus Ennis on Shaw, where he details his travels around when he was with the BBC. And he presents each of them in the dialect of the Irish that he, he was doing. So when he's in Kirk Aguina, he presents it in that Irish. When he's up in Donegal, he presents it in Donegal Irish. As a collector, very important man, because if you look at his, his sort of, he, he had a 20 year period in his life where he worked and all of them connected in different ways with music. 1938 to 42, he was a, working for the Three Candles Press. And in that time, he would have been in the preparation of these books that Colin O'Loughlin published called the Irish Street Ballads 1 and 2. So he must have got some sense of writing music. 42, he went to the Irish Folklore Commission and spent seven years there. The songs and stories in these manuscripts I collected with pen and paper and a push bike, travelling north, south, east and west in all weathers, for it was during the war years. I would make a final copy of each tune as legibly as possible for the archives. Sean O'Sullivan, now lecturer in folklore, was the archivist, and my place was in Sean's office when at headquarters, transcribing and finalising for archives the material I brought back with me. The texts are all now bound together in large volumes, and a thing I very much appreciate is the privilege granted to me to refer to my manuscripts whenever I wish. 
you just picture the life of the collector at that stage to go by bicycle, bad roads, bad bicycles. I don't think there was any plastic at that stage. And it doesn't seem as if he ever stayed in the house of the people he was collecting from. So you can imagine at the end of the night having painstakingly no recording equipment early on, so written down with pencil, rubbing it out, checking each note, and then climbing on the bike and cycling maybe 10 miles in, in the rain, and did that for about seven years. He then went to Radio Aaron, and he wasn't collecting music there, he was making general programs as part of the Radio Aaron mobile recording unit, where they were making programs about anything and everything, the trams the, in Dublin, the Foxford Woolen Mills, but a fair bit of music as well, and he collected more music than he, he would have needed for the programme, so that was his love. And then he left Radio Air in 51, went to the BBC, and from there up to about 1959, 1960, he worked again the same sort of work, uh, but this time collecting in England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and they produced a, a seminal sort of programme called As I Roved Out on a Sunday morning, and I think that proved so popular that it probably prompted Radio Aaron, to, they felt they probably needed to emulate this and they took on Porrick's father, Kieran McMahon, who was a great collector then and sort of brought Irish music to, to the fore. After that, he didn't really work. He just spent the rest of his time traveling around with, with music and so forth. But uh, it, when you look at his life and you look at all he did and the, the, the beautiful transcriptions, his piping, his whistle playing, his entertaining, he was a great stage entertaining, his, his lilting, most remarkable man. As I say, we knew him as, as children, myself, and then we knew, knew him as adults, but I think even now, I'm still kind of getting to grips with how much of a genius he was. So I, I think it's really good that the, the centre and the County Council have just put this, what looks like a very good programme together to honour him, because he's worth it, and it'll be of great cultural value to, to everyone when it, when it does happen. So I congratulate everyone, and wish the thing very well as it goes on. Mila Buekas, thanks. To officially cut the ribbon, we might drag Ivor Brown up. Um, Ivor, we'll ask a few questions maybe about Seamus. Will you come up and have a few words? You'd be tired of this cluster of browns. <laughs> <laughs> I first met Seamus in 1959. I remember he came over to the, the FLA in Lisdown Varna and he brought this fellow from Arizona with him, who was six feet seven and a half inches in a large Stetson hat. And little fellows would come up to this fellow and say, what height are you? And he'd say, I'm five, nineteen and a half. Jeez, I could have sworn you were over six feet. <laughs> but, but he was just a, a remarkable human being, a tremendous scholar, tremendous knowledge of Irish and, and literature and of course a wonderful piper. So he really was a, a genuine genius. There's a famous, there's a famous recording uh, from just after that when he came back uh, from Liz and Varna. Well, yeah, it was actually, are you talking about when the time we went out to Doolan, which wasn't a celebrated tourist kind of place at the time. And to get some quiet so that they could record the playing because Kieran was there, Porrick's father, Kieran. Yeah, he was there. There were two recordings. And happening. Sean O'Donica. Sean O'Donica, yeah. yeah, that's right, yeah. I remember they were halfway up the stairs. But um, Leo was playing, and, and he was playing as he did, you know. Leo Rossum. Yeah, Leo Rossum, very competently. But when Seamus sat down, because he, he could be a little cruel, he, he, he wanted to show what he could do. and. We have recordings of that session actually still. And he, I remember he played two reels and it was absolutely wonderful. He, he, he said himself he started playing too fast, but he, he went right through it. 
And um, that was the Silver Spear and the Dublin Reel. Wearing his doctor's hat, Ivor benignly watched over Seamus, trying to keep him on the straight and narrow. Do you remember anything about the very last few years? Did you see much of him? I kept in touch with him all the time, and as I say, I had this, this male nurse who used to check on him whenever he started to go astray. Uh, Somebody said that uh, he was called Ivor's Gestapo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because I had spies all over Dublin, different musicians, and they'd let me know, because Seamus was supposed to be on orange juice, but he'd start tipping some vodka into it. And once I heard that, then I'd send this male nurse, John Bergen, out to him. And Seamus would go out then to my sister-in-law, and he'd say, Ivor sent that gentleman out to my <laughs> premises. <laughs> and he could never make out how I knew <laughs> that he was... He was slipping. <laughs> so shall we officially launch and open the, the year's celebrations? Yeah. It was suggested by Deirdre that you could officially open this. <laughs> With no ribbon. To With no it. ribbon. <laughs> oh. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, thanks, Ivor. I won't wait. The pipes that Seamus played throughout his life were made by Morris Coyne in the mid-1800s. They came to the Ennis household in an unusual way. My father went to London, 1906 or 1908. He went to compete at a flute playing championship in the concert flute, and he won the championship. And the prize was a concert flute in a beautiful mahogany with ivory and ebony inlay case and uh, whatever money. And with the money, he went to a pawn shop and bought this set of pipes in pieces in a sack for some awful sum, like four pounds or five pounds at the time. Mm -hmm. And he brought them home and he gave them to John Brogan of Harold's Cross, who was a bricklayer by trade and a pipes maker and repairer by hobby. Incidentally, he was the father of the late Harry Brogan of the Abbey Theatre. And he set the pipes in order and they're playing ever since. So here we are today, five pipers of some skill and experience looking forward to playing this famous set of pipes. I wonder what pitfalls await us. First up is Porig MacMahuna. Let the games begin. Thanks, Roland, and thanks, Ivor. It's, it's great to be here. Um, I'm, I, I've edited out quite a number of stories about Seamus that uh, <laughs> would be for a late night company. But uh, the first time, uh, a bit similar to, to Ivor, the first time I met Seamus uh, was in the back of, back of, of Baby Quiddy's pub in Milltown and we were on, we used to go on holidays to Milltown and like the Peter and uh, but I were in the Browns and uh, there would be a change now but in the back of my memories were there uh, Woody Clancy and Padre Lachlan, JC Talty and all those guys and, and Seamus as you say used to stay there and I think it's fair to say on occasions overstay his welcome. <laughs> He'd stay for a weekend and six weeks later the, the hint was not taken, but uh, he became part of the furniture. But he was great with kids and um, he used to play games with you. And uh, so that was the first time I saw them. And the first time we played them was in the caravan in the Nall, uh, out the road, very close to the lotto winners, I presume. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, the, and the... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Robbie, Robbie Hannan and myself went out and uh, 
it was in those days there was no mobile phones. He didn't have a phone in the caravan, obviously, and uh, we, the, the word would go out, and uh, from and the Piper's Club was in in, in Temple Bar, Essex Street. Well, yeah. yeah. So there used to be delegations sent out now and again. Anyway, we arrived at lunchtime and. Um, we went in and was, he was in the pyjamas and, and he said, give me an hour. So we went off and he got into the suit and he always had the suit on and the tie. And then we said we'd adjourn for a drink, naturally. And we said, well, well we go down the street. But he said, no, we, we can't go down the street. And, and it, the word was, he'd slightly overstayed his welcome. He, the car, he had backed the car in to the front door of the, of the, of the local hostelry. And I think, so we said, we'll go down to Ballybuckle. And we went down to Ballybuckle on the wrong side of the road in his old Zephyr, which is like the old. This was his new car. Remember, his old car was a 63 Zephyr. His new car was a 65 Zephyr. The jug is barking now. He can't play the tune. But mother, you know, they say dogs bark when they see the moon. But how can he see the moon? Get when he is old and blind. Blind dogs don't bark at the moon, you know, nor fiddles don't play with the wind with me falda de la la, me falda de la li, to me falda de la la, right falda de la la da li, and you lads when courting go, and for your sweetheart's wait, take care not to whistle too loud in case the old one might wake. From the days when I was young, forget I never can. I knew the difference between a fiddle, a dog, and a man who be followed the la la. Getting back into the car, I remember, Robbie was very worried. I was very worried. <laughs> and then he sat in, and then I, I said, Seamus, could I drive? <laughs> and, he, and he kind of sat there, and then he got out of the car and walked around into the passion, and I sat in. And there was a relief, Jobby and myself were relieved. First of all, we knew we would drive on the left-hand side, but the, <laughs> instead of the middle of the road. And all the neighbours knew, so they kind of got out of the way. And he said, just before we were pulling back into the, going back to the caravan, he says, you realise, he said, it wasn't that I wasn't capable of driving. It was just to give you the pleasure of driving my new car. <laughs> so, so Robbie and myself played them that day, and then the, last, the next time I saw them, uh, Liam passed away and he, he gave the pipes, passed them on to Liam for obvious reasons that Liam was the man that could play them. And I think Liam used to play them on, on doing solo tours with the Rousen set and he'd play these as well. And then but I think in the latter years he was, I don't think he played them that much, so, but uh, luckily, anyway, it's a long story, but he, he mentioned a couple of months before he passed away that he was making arrangements and it was kind of a difficult conversation. That he. He said he wanted me to have these, so that was a great honour and privilege. So um, they hadn't been played, but Donico O'Dwyer did a good, great job to put them back, uh, put, put them back on the road. And uh, so anyway, we'll, enough talk, and we'll, I think we're going to play a tune each. And we're going to, we were initially going to frighten Ronan and say, we'll all play the books of Omar or ten times. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to play a slight cheat. It's, it's, it's an air and then it's a jig. That's two. That, yeah, but it's one. So hopefully they're <laughs> tuned up. As Seamus used to say, young chaps like us.
The coin is a magnificent set of pipes, and in the hands of Seamus Ennis, they seem easy to play. Like any set of pipes, the Ennis coin has its quirks. Porig played flawlessly because he knows the set. But there was something Seamus didn't tell us earlier about this sack of pieces his father Jimmy had found in London. It was a left, not a right-handed set. When John Brogan rebuilt the pipes, it was an easy task to convert the body of the set to right-handed, but the chanter, including the layout of the keys, remains to this day left-handed. Now, why does this matter? Because when played by a right-handed player who, who doesn't yet know the set, the topmost key block makes covering the C tone hole extremely difficult. Unlike Porig, the rest of us are completely unaware of this possible pitfall. Up next, Jimmy O'Brien Moran. Jimmy's different because Jimmy <laughs> didn't know Seamus as a child and he fell in love with piping listening to Liam O'Flynn and then fell in love. His first LP was, was Seamus and you wore it to a crisp. I wore it out. Jimmy O'Brien Morton. Actually, uh, that lovely air that Porrick played was the lament for the fox. And interestingly enough, Willie and Seamus, uh, Willie Clancy and Seamus Ennis were wonderful pipers, but they were slight, they were good friends, but kind of rivals as well. And when Willie died, I wonder what was going on in, 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 in Seamus's mind, but he played that over the grave, the lament for the fox. <laughs> well, now, this is actually, for me, like driving Seamus's Zephyr. I've never, I've never really, I did, he let me play them in 1976 or 7, but I don't really remember too much about it. And the strange thing for us to be playing this set is that we have an idea of what Seamus, the sound that Seamus produced on this set, and so we're hoping it's going to come out when we play. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe that's a bit optimistic. Anyway, I'm going to play, uh, yeah, I, I, I first actually met Seamus at a, a, a festival in Gorey County, Wexford. Uh, it was a, a, an arts festival. The programme was, strangely enough, called The Gory Detail. <laughs> and uh, and Seamus was playing, and I, was, I, I wasn't actually playing the pipes at the time, and I arrived down and I went up to him afterwards, terribly nervous, terrified. And there was a photograph of his father playing this set, and there was a brass turnaround here for extra notes. It's called a bass regulator turnaround or something like that. And uh, Seamus never used it. So I plucked up the courage. This was my only way to ask him a question. I said, uh, do you know the, the bass regulator? And he says, no, what's that? <laughs> Which completely deflated me. I nearly ran back in, in absolute mortification. But uh, I did get to uh, organise a gig for him in, in Galway in the 70s, in the later 70s. And uh, I went to collect him from his room and we were chatting away and, and actually he let me play the pipes, which was a, a wonderful honour. But again, I didn't quite manage to make them sound like Seamus. Anyway, I'm going to play the first two tunes of, quickly, of uh, that first LP that I ever listened to of Seamus. So here we go. Have you got the keys of the Zephyr there? <laughs> I'm terrified. Yeah. <laughs> no pressure, Jimmy, no pressure. <laughs> 40, 43 years later. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, well, Jimmy had a few speed wobbles, but he came through relatively unscathed. So Neely. Neely Mulligan. Domestic I, I remember seeing Seamus once and he was doing, he, he was a great man when he was playing to be kind of strapping himself in and then kind of wheezing at this point. But I remember one time someone said to him, you know, are you, are you, is the television, but are you ready? And he said, just blowing up now. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think that the time I played these was 1974, around Christmas time. In those days, um, we didn't have a phone in the house, so Seamus would send a telegram <laughs> to the house to say, could Nady please come to, it was in the old Ballymun Road, he was in a kind of a flat to the side of a house there. Um, so it was after Christmas, he was on his own. So I ended up going up to him every day when I was, I suppose, on, on holidays from school. And um, we had a wonderful time together. And um, it was mainly just listening to Seamus and uh, he'd be talking, making pots of tea and sending me down to Tolga House for a bottle of Jemison, whatever. <laughs> Because um, I was a young kid at the time, he'd give me a note to go down and hand it to the barman. And uh, <clears throat> he used to get that. So, But um, we had a wonderful time and, and eventually at the end of the week he, he let me put on the pipes and uh, tried to play a few tunes. And I found it very uh, different to my own C sharp, my father's C sharp set. But anyway, we knocked a tune or two out of them. Uh, and then another time in Essex Street, one time he would... Mm just asked me to, to finish up after he'd been playing himself. So uh, I think it was getting near closing time and he wanted to run off. So anyway, that, that was the, the privilege and the honour to play them in those days. Remember when they uh, talked about um, Willie Clancy in the funeral? I remember Seamus played this tune for Willie Easter Snow at the, in the church in Milltown yeah, Malbay. So I just moved this chanter slightly.
Platinelli, he faced and overcame the monster with a plum. But now it's my turn and I'm starting to shake. Um, I'll play two jigs, the, the Butcher's March and When the Cock Crows is, Crows of His Day, if I can. Two tunes that myself and I will always end up playing and whistles together. Uh, Jimmy was saying that the bee hole is in a funny position and that's why we're all having trouble covering the chanter. And it would be grand if it was the E hole down the bottom, but the B hole is third from the top, which means that everything below that turns into mush. <sighs> Your piping wasn't mush at all. No, 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 no. Mush it was. Mush it were not. I can't play them at all. <laughs> Give a bit of pressure to start. No, hardly. There we are. Oh, I know what it is. It's the C. Yeah. Yeah. Mush. was an experience never to be repeated. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> oh, I have a new found respect for Seamus Ennis. <laughs> and now Peter Brown is the last of the magnificent five to face the beast. Um, unlike the everyone else, I've actually seen these pipes but never even touched them, so I just hope that at least some small bit of the magic rubs off, though I doubt it. But it, it's probably like um, driving, uh, driving someone else's car for the first time, but I, I don't drive, so I can only guess at that. However, there's been a lot of mention of the Zephyr, and uh, I know that I, I, sometime in the early 70s, I went on an excursion with Seamus. We left Dublin on a Thursday to drive up to play in Bondoran, and on the way back, the luck ran out. <laughs> in the sense that Seamus, there's a humpback bridge the far side of Mullingar, which Seamus chose to overtake on, and unfortunately, the road coming at him wasn't clear. So I can't say that I went through his windscreen, but I can say that after the thing, my glasses were broken and the windscreen was no longer there. <laughs> so, and 
He was living at that time in a house in Terenur with Liam O'Flynn and Liam's brother, uh, Michael or Michal. And uh, I remember I, I rang a couple of days later, you know, because Seamus was in hospital, but he'd come back. And I, I, I rang, and Pat Sky, who was an American pipe maker and a lot of other things, was in the house. So I, I rang and I said, is Seamus there? And he said, sure, he's here. I said, how is he? He said, he looks like his pipes just blew up on them. <laughs> <laughs> with the bandages and that. Um, just one other thing comes to mind about Seamus. The, there's a beautiful film, which you may get a chance to see, made by Eamon de Butler, called Miles and Miles of Music, about all his collecting work. And it was, uh, part of this was a sort of like a bespoke recital in Eamon de Butler's house, I think it was, in Bray. So it was very much Seamus playing these pipes, and about 20 or 30 people sitting there, kind of at the master's feet, as it were. But uh, there was a guy there who was, I remember him from UCD, he, he was a Baron player, and he was very, very enthused by the whole thing. So when there was a short break, he came up to Seamus and he said, uh, this is wonderful, Seamus, I have the bowl on out in the boot of the car, will I bring it in? To which Seamus, and if you know him, it's just like he said, well, not for me anyway, thank you. <laughs> 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 so I'm going to play a jig that, it's interesting about Seamus, he, not to me, he never taught as such, and there wasn't much teaching in that era, he, but he would, he would tell you what not to do, in my case, more than what he would do, and he used to say, say, that's vulgar, or my father would say, my father would say that that's vulgar. So he, in my instance, I can only say he would disapprove of things he did rather than approve of them. Maybe, maybe that's more what he heard than, than anything else that was caused that. So the jig is called the Lark's March, I'll try it. No. Oh, but it's a great privilege to play them, I have to say Absolutely. that. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, I, no. Yes, Perrick, yeah. So let's see if the drums are easy. We'll start them first.
If you've made it this far, well done. And thank you for your patience in staying with us as we fell headlong into the realization that this wonderful instrument leads a double life. Oh, yeah. Thank you. One thank thing you. which nobody mentioned Seamus's car, as you mentioned, this 1965 Zephyr, the it was a Clare registration and it was DIE. <laughs> <laughs> it just had to be DIE. Not only is it one of the most beautifully toned and expressive instruments ever made, but as the devil's very own clandestine implement of torture, it can reduce an unsuspecting player to that most dreaded state, that of despairing octopus wrestler. To show us how it should be done, let's see how the coin pipes behave in the hands of the master himself. Seamus Ennis has been a lifelong inspiration to all of us older pipers, but we're not the only ones who have dedicated our lives to playing the Irish pipes. When this photo of a Tionol gathering of pipers was taken in 1973, it comprised nearly all of the pipers playing at the time. If that photograph was taken today, there would be thousands more trying to get a look in. Through his recordings, his collecting and documentaries made about him, Seamus Ennis has left us a hugely important legacy as a musician and singer and as a collector of Irish music and song. He has inspired, and will continue to inspire, many more generations of pipers. As Peter Brown said at the beginning of this presentation, we can't say he was the best, but we can say there was none better. <laughs>